loving it Are you loving it? Yeah, you know you loving it And if you loving it, you can't get enough of it Put a hand high, right where the other is To the weak, but can't find a quitter in me It's that bit of sweet literature, that little your streets Walk with the Prince of Peace, see where these footprints Hey, this is Dr. K from my medical school Today we're going to talk about heart failure Specifically, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction so first, let's talk about the different categories of heart failure. Well, there are really two types of heart failure. There's one, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And we did a video about this before, so refer to that to learn more about this. Preserved ejection fraction is otherwise known as diastolic heart failure. And we use HFPEEF, otherwise known as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, to represent it. Next is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, otherwise known as systolic heart failure, represented as HFREF, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Systolic heart failure is characterized by a dilated cardiomyopathy, meaning the chamber or the ventricle of the heart dilates. And because it dilates, it has a thinner wall and less muscle, and this leads to a decrease or impaired contractility it means not able to pump as well as it normally is. So what are the causes of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Well number one is coronary artery disease. This accounts for about 80 percent of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Hypertension, otherwise known as high blood pressure, diabetes, alcohol. So alcoholics will tend to have what's called an alcoholic cardiomyopathy meaning the alcohol caused dilation of their ventricles and chambers, leading to heart failure. Viral infections. And finally, chemotherapy. The classic chemotherapy agents that can lead to heart failure are number one, doxorubicin, and two, trastuzumab. So keep that in mind and make sure to look forward in a patient's history if you're considering heart failure as one of their problems. Now, let's discuss the signs and symptoms of heart failure. So as you may know, Many patients with heart failure will present with dyspnea, or shortness of breath. They may have peripheral edema. That means they have fluid retention in their legs because their heart isn't able to pump as well. So all the blood backs up and backs up in gravity-dependent areas, especially their legs. They may have fatigue. They may have an S3 murmur. They may have proximal nocturnal dyspnea, meaning they wake up in the middle of the night, short of breath, have to open a window to really catch their breath orthopnea and JVD. Make sure to assess the amount of pillows they use at night. Are they having to raise their body up to allow them to breathe better because of all the fluid that's on board and their heart's not able to pump as well. So these are kind of some key things to look out for, both the signs and symptoms, that may indicate a patient is developing heart failure or has heart failure. So how do we diagnose heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Well, a lot of times we get chest x-rays in the hospital and it may show cardiomegaly, meaning the shadow of the heart is larger than half of the thorax. This can be an indicator for heart failure, but it doesn't necessarily mean that someone has heart failure. It's a very nonspecific finding. A patient with pulmonary edema on the chest x-ray, that may also be indicative of heart failure, but again, it's very nonspecific. Many things can cause that. So these are things to think about, but they're not the diagnostic for heart failure. A lab we get is called brain natriuretic peptide, or BNP. We order this commonly in patients with heart failure to see if they're having an exacerbation, meaning if the heart failure is getting worse. Realize that BNP can be normal in obese patients, so really it's your clinical judgment that's really going to drive everything, the diagnosis. But most of all, you really need what's called an echocardiogram, otherwise known as an ultrasound of your heart. Through that, they'll be able to tell whether you have a dilated heart chamber, the ejection fraction present, um, its exact percentage that it can calculate, and that will give you kind of a global picture of what's going on with the heart and whether heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is really present. Now before we talk about the treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, let's talk about classification. There are really two systems. The first classification we'll talk about is called the New York Heart Association Heart Failure Classification. It's broken up into four classes. Class 1, Class 2, Class 3, and Class 4. Class 1 in this classification system is a patient who really has no impairment in activity because of their heart failure and don't really have any symptoms that really affect their lives whatsoever. Class 2, patients will have slight impairment in activity, but they're generally comfortable at rest. Ordinary daily activity does result in them feeling tired and short of a breath. 
but they're still able to do some activity. Class 3 patients have symptoms that are a lot more profound. They have significant limitation of activity. They're comfortable at rest, but even any slight activity results in them feeling tired or short of breath. And that finally brings us to class 4 patients. Class 4 patients are your most severely affected patients. Any activity, and even being at rest itself, they still have symptoms, and they really don't go away. So you have to be very careful with these patients. So this is your basic NYHA classification system for heart failure. Now let's talk about the next classification system. The second classification system is the ACC slash AHA stages of heart failure, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association stages of, of heart failure. These are four stages going from stage A, stage B, stage C, and stage D. Stage A heart failure are patients who are high risk for heart failure due to their other comorbidities. They have no structural or functional abnormalities on echocardiogram, and they're definitely without any symptoms. So these are people just really at high risk. In stage B, however, you have patients who have structural abnormalities, I mean, there is some heart disease present, but they haven't developed symptoms yet. So you can see, you know, kind of of a hill, these patients are more towards the top of the hill. And that brings us to stage C. These people have come over the top. They've actually, not only do they have structural heart disease associated with heart failure, now they have symptoms present as well. And that finally brings us to stage D. In stage D, you have structural abnormalities consistent with heart failure with very severe system symptoms, even though they're on maximal medical therapy. So now that we've covered the classification systems of heart failure, let's talk about the treatment of reduced ejection fraction heart failure. Whenever one thinks about heart failure, the main class that comes to mind is diuretics. Diuretics are pills that help us relieve water from the body, and in heart failure, they're really used for symptom relief of shortness of breath and fluid retention. Note that diuretics do not relieve, or do not improve, I should say, morbidity and mortality, except for spironolactone. We'll talk about that a little bit later. In terms of diuretics, we generally add them on as kind of like a stepwise approach. So you can start with a loop diuretic like furosemide, use a thiazide diuretic like metolazone, and then if needed, add, add spironolactone. Now, when you're adding these different diuretics, what this called is sequential nephron blockade. You're essentially blocking the nephron at different stages along it to promote water loss. In addition, when you have patients on diuretic therapy, you really need to monitor their electrolytes, their sodium, their potassium, as well as their creatinine and kidney, kidney function. You need to monitor their weight as well to make sure that their weights are coming down and they're improving on diuretic therapy. Next, let's talk about ACE inhibitors, otherwise known as angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. These are first line therapy for patients who have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Now, for ACE inhibitors, they have a lot of really good benefits. So number one, they reduce symptoms. Two, they reduce ventricular size. Three, they improve the ejection fraction of the heart. And finally, they also decrease the risk of having a myocardial infarction or heart attack. They're really recommended for all classes of left ventricular dysfunction. So people with poor EFs. Examples include captopril, lisinopril, and enalapril. Now when patients are on this, you need to make sure you're monitoring their potassium, you're monitoring their kidney function with creatinine, evaluating them for cough and angioedema because these can be side effects of ACE inhibitor therapy and making sure they're not developing hypotension since you're starting a new medication that will affect their blood pressure as well. Continuing on, let's talk about ARBs or angiotensin receptor blockers. These are a very good class of medications and very similar effects to ACE inhibitors. Um, they have the same benefits as ACE inhibitors and they're really used as an alternative therapy to ACE inhibitors. So people who can't tolerate ACE inhibitors, we try them on ARB. So if they have a cough and they're not able to tolerate it well, you can use an ARB. Now, there's been a lot of dispute about using combination ARBs with ACE inhibitors, but really, it, there is no benefit with using that combination. It increases renal dysfunction and the risk of hyperkalemia without achieving any significant benefit in morbidity and mortality. So you either use an ACE inhibitor or use an ARB, but not both. Examples of ARBs include candesartan, valsartan, and losartan. Just like ACE inhibitors, you want to monitor your potassium levels, your creatinine and kidney function, as well as your blood pressure, so monitor that for hypotension as well. Now moving on, let's talk about beta blocker therapy. So beta blockers have several important benefits for patients with reduced ejection fraction heart failure. Number one is they improve systolic function. 
They increase the EF 5 to 10 percent. They reduce the symptoms the patient experiences. And finally, they decrease mortality, which is probably the most important. A point that I really want to stress is do not start or stop beta blocker therapy during an acute CHF exacerbation, meaning if a patient is having an acute CHF exacerbation and they're on beta block therapy, keep it as long as their blood pressure is okay. But if they're not on one, don't start one in the middle of the exacerbation. Also, beta blocker therapy is contraindicated in asthma as well as second and third degree AV block because beta blockers can cause bronchoconstriction and also worsen AV block. Examples of beta blocker therapy include metoprolol or CR or XL, carvedilol, and abivalol. You really want to monitor for bradycardia, bronchospasm, and hypotension when maintaining someone or starting someone on beta blocker therapy. The next category of drugs we're going to talk about are aldosterone blockers. So these include your plerinone and your spironolactone. The benefits of aldosterone blockers is that they reduce mortality, symptoms, and hospitalizations for patients with reduced ejection fraction heart failure. You really should add this to any person who has an NYHA class 3 or 4 despite medical therapy. You want to monitor for things like hyperkalemia, hypotension, and renal dysfunction. Now before I was talking about diuretic therapy, in this case, you want to make sure spironolactone is added even if the patient may or may not be on diuretic therapy. Finally, we come to one of the last pharmacological treatments, and that's hydralazine with isorbide dinitrate. This combination is used instead of spironolactone in African American patients, which it has been shown to increase survival and reduce hospitalization within. On patients who are on this set of therapy, again, you want to monitor for things such as hypotension and make sure to use these in line with first-line therapies as well. Now that we talked about what you should give in terms of pharmacological treatments, there are a couple things you should avoid in patients with heart failure. So your thiazolinidones, so these are things that we use for diabetes, antiarrhythmics because they don't improve morbidity and mortality, and any type of NSAIDs. Make sure your heart failure patients get their influenza and pneumococcal vaccinations, which are definitely recommended in these set of patients. In addition, you want to consider if they need ICD therapy. Because patients with significant heart failure are at a higher risk of sudden cardiac death because ventricular rhythms are, are much more probable in these patients. So the indications for placing defibrillator are the patient has an EF less than 35% despite maximal medical therapy and they have an expected survival greater than one year. Now atrial synchronized biventricular pacing has a different set of indications. We usually use this type of pacing because of there's an increased risk of actual conduction delays with very severe heart failure. And the subset of the patients that meet this criteria are, one, they have to have three or four class NYHA heart failure, despite being on maximal therapy, an EF of 35% or lower, it must be in sinus rhythm, and the QRS complex must be wide, greater than 120 milliseconds. Then you should consider these patients for biventricular pacing. Finally, we come back to cardiac rehabilitation. This is really recommended in any patient who has any symptoms with their heart failure. It improves functional capacity and, I believe, most importantly, quality of life. But no, it does not improve morbidity or mortality. So, we just a brief review of heart failure and its treatment as well as diagnosis. Make sure if you like this video, give it a like. And if you have any comments or suggestions for any future videos, make sure to place them down below. Make sure to share this video on both Facebook as well as Twitter. And you can follow us on Twitter at iMedSchool. Also, make sure to listen to our podcast, brand new, iMedicalSchool on iTunes, where we cover completely different topics that you can take a listen to as well. All right, it's Dr. K from iMedicalSchool. I'll see you next time.